9 30, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. This is uh, Why Should I Care About Async IO? I'm uh, Joel Watts. I work at Decisio Health. We've got a booth out there. We do a real time uh, clinical support dashboard. It's the TV in the uh, another room. I'm in that's built on async technologies, and I'm going to talk today about why we why we should care about concurrency, and kind of how Python support for concurrency has evolved, especially lately, and, and why it's pretty exciting. So this this is a picture I took um, last year at this conference of us getting lunch on Saturday. I think I used this slide last year, so you may have seen it before. But uh, basically, I think this is a really good overview of kind of what the concurrency problem is and how. Sometimes you just want to write a program that has to do a lot of things at the same time. And you can kind of imagine how in the uh, a traditional program where you have, you know, like four customer in list of customers do, you know, make burgers or whatever, how, how that gets backed up really fast because each, each person that you make a burger for, it takes a long time to do that. And so they, they've addressed this problem and some of the terminology up there is async IO terminology and I can, I can cover it, but essentially they have more than one worker in that van who's making burgers, right? And the, the person taking orders sort of drives the process. So they, they go through, you place an order, and then you go, you're, you're, you turn into a future at that point, and you, uh, essentially you're waiting for your result, right? Your, your hamburger. And this, so this is kind of just an example of how, how that process takes place and the, and the problem we're trying to solve here. So now I'm going I'm to step, step back a little bit. And this, this, is a, this is not an async function. This is an example of using requests to get an HTML page Request is an HTTP client library that I imagine a lot of us have used. And the whole idea here is we go out, we, get a UR, we take a URL, we make a request, we get the, the uh, page content, and we return it. And that's great, and it's a really good example of a clean Python function that does one thing, one thing well, and uh, it's easy to understand. But the big problem that it has is this, this item I've highlighted in green, and it's that that function, until it's actually gone out, done its DNS resolution, Sent, sent the request across the wire, received the request body back, and decoded it, and ready, that, that statement doesn't return, and, you never, and your program doesn't move on. And as long as you only want one page, that's actually not a problem. But if you want to request a lot of pages, the, that time starts to stack up, and a lot of your time in your program is spent waiting on network activity and not actually doing anything that your computer is able to do. Your, your computer can do a lot of these at the same time, except for that it has to, you know, unless it's waiting on the response. And so that, that's kind of the, there's, there's lots of ways that we've come up with to, uh, to solve this problem and start doing more than one thing at a time. And I'm gonna talk about a few of them and then I'm gonna show you the approach that, uh, that Python has kind of evolved to. So uh, this, this first example is actually J JavaScript. So that's a jQuery request to get, a, get data in. JavaScript is a good example that, we've, that a lot of us have seen of an event loop plus callbacks. And so JavaScript has a, an underlying event loop. So it's essentially a while true that's always running and that's running your code. And then you, you can actually interact with the run loop to, uh, through set timeout or clear timeout and those kind of methods. And it, in this case, what's going on is we tell, we create an Ajax object, we, we say go fetch this page, and then once you have it, come back and, and call me back and call my function. So we have a, we have a callback here and then that's, that's the callback. And so I, I wanted to use a JavaScript example because that's actually a place where mo I think more people have interacted with callbacks because it's not as common a pattern in Python. But this is, uh, this is tornado code. And tornado, I, I want to say up front that I'm, this is a little unfair to tornado because they've kind of evolved towards a, a better approach. But I wanted to, this is kind of how I learned how to do async in Python. So we, uh, this is the, uh, the highlighted version. So essentially we create the callback, we go out and make a request. And the, and the critical thing is that, that uh, when, HTTP, when async HTTP client makes a request, it doesn't, it returns to you immediately and, won't, and your program continues to run. Until your and then your callback is called only when your uh, when the response payload is ready, and so your program can go on and do other things during that time. And it, I, I didn't show the event loop, but I but uh, Tornado provides an I/O loop that that makes all that possible. And then another approach that some of us may have used is threading, and I'm going to multi-processing works a little differently, but the API is basically the same, and so we're going to I'm going to just kind of shove that all under threading. But essentially, you create you create your your function. You pass it off to a thread. It runs it in the background, and it, but critically, it's a synchronous, synchronous function. So the, uh, you know what? I'm going to step back real quick with uh, callbacks. The big thing I want to emphasize here is that this um, starts looking less and less like Python code. Like it, it's 
it gets hairy as, as if you want the return value of these functions, you have to jump through hoops to get the value out of the callbacks. And so while it does work and it's sane and you can, you can reason about it if you think hard enough, it's, it gets, as these get more and more nested, it gets more and more difficult to deal with them. And so threading has the real benefit of it. That, that function, that, that get content function is the same function we wrote at the beginning. And it's, so it's, it's clean, it's readable, I can understand that function. But when they start, the, the issue that you get into with threading is that you, you don't control when threads run, the, op, the operating system does. And so you have to make sure that you, like this function doesn't have side effects, but if you have side effects, like you're manipulating a shared data structure, you have to introduce locking and, and issues like that. And the, the, when your thread runs is out of your control. And so, and you would you would be running that inside some sort of a loop to create lots of threads and run them, or using some sort of thread pool. But, uh, so anyway, that's that's the uh, the part that we don't like that that stops looking as much like the request version and uh, starts getting complicated. So then the uh, the next approach I wanted to talk about was green threads, and uh, or G event, you know, greenlets G event. This is the same thing. Essentially, these are these are thread like things that are running inside your main process, but they're not OS threads. And this has the really nice effect of that our, pro our program looks synchronous. You can, almost, uh, you can almost pretend like that monkey patch isn't up there. Um, and our code essentially runs the same way, except for that when we call request.get or any other blocking I.O. function, under the hood, the green, uh, G event allows you to switch between multiple coroutines. They, they, they're calling coroutines there, too. We're going to kind of introduce a different, slightly different coroutine. But so anytime you call blocking I.O., you get a new, you get a chance to run other code, and this this is this is great because it allows us to write code procedurally and sequentially, and then we just magically get concurrency. The problem, of course, is that you magically get concurrency, and the uh, it's not always clear where you're going to call blocking I/O. Like a, a good example I've seen is if you add a, a log statement to this function, if as soon as you hook up a a network log handler to that. You've now introduced an, an I/O function in a, in a statement that doesn't look like it's I/O, and so you, we're back to essentially threading where we don't we don't necessarily realize where our program is going to switch contexts. And so this this is kind of the first place where I saw sort of a different way of attacking this problem. And we're so like I said with Tornado, we have an I/O loop, so in that sense, it works like JavaScript. Um, and, and the original version I showed you had callbacks, but this is this is a way that they've found to work around callbacks. And instead, we're gonna we're gonna take advantage of the uh, of generator syntax in Python to uh, to make this look more like procedural or sorry sequential code. Um, and I'll talk about it. But we have the downside that it gets a little bit weird looking. So the uh, we have to have the gen coroutine decorator, and I'll, I'll explain this. But the uh, we use a yield, and I'm going to go into generators a little bit just so that we are all on the same page. And then we, uh, in order to get a value out of a generator, you can't, in earlier versions of Python, this is actually not true now, but you, you couldn't return out of a generator. And so if you wanted to get a value out of a generator, you had to yield it or, or raise an exception. And so that's, this gen return thing is kind of a hack on the, the exception process to get a value out of the generator. And so this, just real quick, this is what generators do. So you, uh, generators are essentially a way to create Iterables in Python, so like a list, right, is an iterable. So you have a list of A, B, C, D, E, F. You can loop over it, you know, four, four letter in list. Um, generators are a way of generating something that's list-like, but you don't have to have the whole, all the values up front. So you can, you, each time you call next on a generator, you get the next value. But you don't necessarily, it doesn't maintain all the values, just, just the next one. So in the same way, you, you can't really build an infinite list because you, you can't have a list that contains all numbers but you can make a generator that yields numbers forever. And so that, that's sort of that's what a generator is. And just to be clear, so if you iterate over Gen 2, you say, you know, for, for C in Gen 2, you would get A, then B, then C, then D, then E, then F. And another thing that I found a lot of people are maybe a little unclear on is that you can yield as many times as you want in a generator. It's, you're not limited in any way to one statement. But this gets a little tedious because if you want to delegate out to another generator, you end up you have to do think you have to loop over the generator to do that, and so you end up with uh, you know, this four C in Gen. That anytime you want to talk to another generator first, you have to loop over it, and so that's that's not terrible, but the syntax gets a little annoying. And so this Python three four sorry, 
3.3, introduced yield from. That's this. And the idea behind yield from is that it, it abstracts away that for loop that you did, now you don't have to write. But it, it also has another nice benefit, and I'll, we'll get to it in a second. But essentially, this is the same thing. So you get A, then B, then C, then D, then E, then F, if you would loop over Gen 2. Because Gen 2 called out to Gen 1 and yielded its, its, task, its uh, content. So this is now, now we're getting to how the uh, a coroutine implementation, which is what Tornado has and then what, where it, what Asyncio provides, can be built out of the pieces pr provided by generators. So instead of yielding A, B, C, D, E, and F, the, uh, in this case we're going to yield tasks. And we have a run loop that iterates over our generator, or our coroutine, that yields tasks. And so the, in this case, we yield task one, our generator runs, and this, sorry, the, uh, the for loop at the bottom is kind of a very simple example of what a run loop is. It, it's, usually it'd be wrapped in a while true and it provides some more functionality for scheduling, but that's the basic idea. So we, we iterate over the generator that we want to call, or the coroutine, I'm going to try to call them coroutines from here on out, that you want to call, you run all the tasks that it yields, and then you, and you move on. And the, the key thing is that those tasks can schedule other tasks. But uh, so in this case, value gen2 yields all the tasks from task one. And then the other thing that yield from provides is that you can now capture that return value. So the return value from gen1, after all the tasks in gen1 have run, is assigned to value in gen2. And then we can continue operating on that. But at each yield point, at each yield from, other, other coroutines that have been scheduled now have a chance to run. And so that, that allows you to have more, you know, more than one thing going on at a time. But it's starting to look a lot more like sequential code. And sequential code is good because we can reason about it. I guess I should have highlighted. So anyway, those are the, kind of the, uh, the new things and we're starting to get more, more and more like our original example. This is a version using AIO HTTP. And I really like this one because it started, like this is, we're basically here at this point. I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and highlight it. But we have, uh, I think there's one more import than the, uh, than the last example, and then the original request example. But I can read that, and if I squint, it looks basically like sequential code. I say response equals aohttp.get, and then I return the text. Now, there's a little bit of secret sauce in there with the yield froms that allows us to call out to the generator, to the uh, to their other coroutines, but I feel like when you're, when you're running that, it makes, there's no callbacks here. Well, there, you know, so basically it works like callbacks, right? The, uh, you, but your function gets called back. And so the uh, you, other languages, I, I think Twisted calls this an inline callback. But we're breaking the link, so we, we no longer have to think about callbacks. What we're thinking about is we have a function, we delegate out to some other function, we call it essentially. Our function pauses, and then when that other function is done, our function gets woken back up and we proceed. So that, that's kind of, I mean, that's, you could kind of describe the, uh, the request version that way too, except for you can only run one at a time. And so this, now we're gonna, this is the, uh, I'll go ahead and go to here. This is the Python 3.5 version of the same, same function. So Python 3.5, <coughs> one, one of the drawbacks of the 3.4 version is that you have to understand, or kind of have to understand the, the generator process that built up to this point. And in 3.5, we, they realized that the, uh, it's actually not that important how it works under the hood. You know, that, it, that, that it's a generator and that we yield tasks. The important thing is that this function can be started, paused, and while other things are running, and then resume when you're ready to proceed. So we've added new syntax where we, instead of having a, a decorator, I think we saw that in there, we don't need to decorate this. What we do instead is we, we have a first class, we have syntax for this where we say async def, that means this is a coroutine, and then inside the context of an async def, we can await other coroutines. And as, once we await a coroutine, it runs, and then when it's done, we get the, res we get the result back. And so that, that's Python 3.5 for the, uh, the original, or plus AIO HTTP for the original requests function. Um, now, I've, I've been talking this whole time about how you want to run, or well, actually, I'm gonna show you first. This is an example of I didn't call um, the uh, request function. We we defined the function. We didn't actually call it. This is a this is a complete program for running that coroutine. So the, 
I'll admit that right now, this, this actually doesn't achieve any more than the request version because it only does one request. I'm going to show that next. But this is a fully executable program. The, the, the trick is that you have to import the run loop. And then your run loop is the main block of your program. So loop.runintelcomplete is essentially that while true that it yield, iterates over your coroutine running its tasks and any tasks that, it, that the coroutines that you run schedule until it's done. And then to, to wrap up with the, uh, the goal being to run more than one task at a time, this is, this is a, an example of how, so I'm going to go back here. Instead of just running get content, this next version is running print lots of content. So you would run this function, run this coroutine until it was complete. So this is the, the highlighted version here. So the, instead of doing, um, with the threading version or anything, you've got to have some kind of a loop that says all the things that you want to do. And so here we are in, ensuring future is a way to tell the, tell the run loop to run something in the future. So we're creating a, a task to print the content of every URL in a list of URLs. And you can imagine we would get that off the command line or through a function call or whatever. We create a task for each function, and then we wait on the results. And so if you, if you called that from inside, uh, you know, if you did loop.run until complete, print lots of content, you, you would in parallel fetch every URL that you pass to it. Whereas if you did that with requests, it would be the first one, then the second one, then the third one, then the fourth, et cetera. And it would take a lot longer to finish. To go back to slide, so this is this is the way that we uh, we address this issue. The uh, ra rather than doing sequential execution in, in the uh, event loop, I can talk a little bit about the terminology. So async IO is the the meat of async IO is the is the event loop, and it's it's really kind of simple. Like it, it's basically just a while true that runs your code, but it also provides a lot of nice helpers for scheduling your, your other tasks. So the uh, the executor is a big one, and the, one of the things to understand too about async is that or, um, the problem that it's really trying to address is, is it's in the name, right? It's I/O. So if you have a task where you're you're trying to compute large numbers or something, those are those are CPU bound tasks, and async is not really going to help you because everything's running in the same process, and if you're if you're running, if you're doing a large computation, that's going to block your process, and you, you can't really do that any faster on one thread besides just throwing more hardware at it. But if you need to wait because you're going out and fetching content, or waiting on a disk, or any other slow process, or, or, or perhaps a, a case where somebody's trying to notify you of something when some event has happened or when something has changed, and your program is just waiting a lot, that's a, that's a good use case for it. However, the, the executor is a way that you can actually delegate. So if I have a... Uh, a CPU bound task that I want to run and wait on. Executors are wrappers around concurrent dot futures, okay. uh, process pools or thread pools. And it essentially it provides a clean API to use async IO's sane scheduling and uh, other features, but then still get access to tools to run CPU and CPU bound code. So I'm gonna wrap it up. Uh, does anybody have any questions? This is, uh, that's me, I'm Joel Watts. Um, thank you. <laughs>